Hi everyone, this is Faye from Kriogs Over Coffee. You've probably noticed that this episode is a little bit longer than our normal 10-minute episodes. This is our first special guest episode. We will at times be interviewing other physicians and experts in the field, and these episodes will tend to be a little bit longer than our normal recordings. We'll be calling these our Venti segments. This is also the first time that we've had a guest on our show, so you'll notice that there are a few issues with our sound. We apologize, and uh, we will have this fixed in the future. So without further ado, here is our first special guest episode with Dr. Lauren Stewart. Hi guys, welcome back. This is Nick. This is Faye. And we are Kriogs over over coffee. coffee. With us today, we have a special guest for the first time. I'd like to introduce Dr. Lauren Stewart. Lauren is a second year female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery fellow, also at Brown, who's published a two-part series on perioperative care. The publications can be found in Topics in Obstetrics and Gynecology in the July and August 2018 issues. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks. Right, so today we're actually gonna talk about perioperative care, so Excellent that we have you with us to guide me and Faye through all of this. Excited to be here. My goals for today were to go over some pointers about how to objectively estimate operative risk when you're seeing patients in clinic and preparing them for surgery. I also want to give you guys some tips about how to decide when and if to order pre-op lab testing and other workup, and how to manage common chronic home medications around the time of surgery and also give you guys some information about ACOG guidelines regarding how to prevent feared complications of surgery, things like uh, VTE and surgical site infection. So as residents, we see a lot of patients in clinic who we may want to pre-op for their hysterectomy or even smaller surgeries. Um, What do I do to talk to my patients about risk and how do I estimate their risk. So how, like, for example, how would I know if someone is a good operative candidate or not? Yeah. So I think that's a really good question. And a lot of us develop a kind of gestalt about which patients are high risk and which ones are lower risk as we go through training. But I think it's important to know that there are a bunch of more objective options out there to help you think about surgical risk. So for example, the most commonly encountered and probably the oldest and most well-studied risk assessment tool is the ASA physical status classification or the ASA score. This was developed back in the 1960s really as a way to classify anesthesia patients for research purposes. And it was interestingly never meant to be a risk calculator, although it has since been extensively validated as such. Important things to know about the ASA score is that it's well known to be super subjective. There's really poor inter-rater variability. Even more important is that non-anesthesiologists have been shown to be really, really poor at using this. So as gynecologists, we probably over or underestimate all of our patients, like more than 50% of the time we're wrong. So it's probably not the best choice for risk stratifying gyne patients. Uh, A really quick and easy risk scoring system uh, that is more useful is the Revised Cardiac Risk Index, or the RCRI. This was designed to estimate specifically the risk of cardiac morbidity and mortality associated with non-cardiac surgery. So this is your patient's risk of having an MI or heart failure perioperatively, as well as other cardiac complications. It only requires six variables. Uh, It's available free online, and it's been extensively validated, including in gyne surgical patients. It can be really, really helpful when thinking about cardiac risk and deciding whether or not to involve consultants in your perioperative planning. That being said, the RCRI has its limitations, mostly that it only addresses cardiac risk. So there have been a lot of efforts to develop better calculators. The National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, or NISQIP, developed an awesome and totally free surgical calculator that's really comprehensive, has been validated in a huge population of over 1.5 million patients, and estimates the risk of all kinds of clinically important surgical outcomes like morbidity, mortality, surgical site infection, urinary tract infection, readmission, and even return to the OR. The downside is that this calculator requires that you input 20 patient variables, ranging from age and gender to lab values and the type of planned surgery, So it makes it a little cumbersome for everyday use. And just to be clear, we will include all three of these scoring systems on the website when we do post this episode so that you guys can go over these 
and scoring systems more extensively on your own time. All right. So I guess we know now that our patients are going to have risks and whatever calculator we decide to use, you know, say we're going to come up with something here. So Lauren, kind of commonly speaking, what things should we be doing? Like what type of testing should we be doing to assess them for these risks? Like should I send everybody for an EKG? Should I get a chest x-ray every time? So as far as I know, ACOG doesn't make any formal recommendations about pre-op lab and cardiopulmonary testing. So I don't have any ACOG specific guidelines to cite here. Nonetheless, I think this is an issue that comes up a lot in everyday practice. So it's nice to have a framework to work within when you're deciding uh, when to get pre-op labs or testing or imaging and when these things probably aren't necessary. With respect to labs, in most cases, a thorough history and physical exam rather than age cutoffs or universal testing policy should be used to guide uh, your pre-op ordering. For example, an otherwise totally healthy 35-year-old who's having a hysterectomy for refractory, abnormal, or heavy uterine bleeding probably should have a baseline CBC prior to undergoing surgery, but she probably also doesn't need a creatinine or electrolyte since those things are really unlikely to be abnormal in her. On the flip side, a 72-year-old with long-standing hypertension who takes diuretics and antihypertensives is much more likely to have baseline creatinine and electrolyte abnormalities that could impact her perioperative care and anesthetic choice. So you would want to get a baseline for her. Um, a good but super basic rule of thumb is that if you have a healthy patient undergoing a minor surgical procedure, she does not need any labs or any pre-op workup at all. She can just proceed to surgery. Uh, this is a really, really big change from as recently as 10 years ago when even young, low-risk patients got a battery of labs and testing before undergoing any type of surgery. So this has been a big, a big shift in the type of care that we provide. One important thing that I just want to point out is that while the general trend has been to move away from ordering a lot of preoperative labs, the one lab that you should think about um, is the preoperative glucose. That is the one test that has been clearly associated with um, poor perioperative outcomes. In patients with known diabetes, uh, you should think about getting either an A1C, a hemoglobin A1C, or an immediate preoperative glucose uh, before surgery to assess their uh, glucose control. And that's because perioperative hyperglycemia has been shown to impact infectious risk and wound healing. The American Diabetes Association recommends that all diabetics have an immediate preoperative glucose of less than 200. And while that's not really based in great data, um, that is the guideline that we have to work in right now. There's emerging data about hemoglobin A1c and post-op infectious risk, um, and probably an A1c cutoff between 7 and 8 is a really good um, cutoff before going to elective surgery. Like, you wouldn't want to do elective surgery on somebody with an A1c much higher than 8, but there haven't been any big prospective well-designed trials to assess this, and so that hasn't really made its way into national guidelines yet. So, great resident research project, basically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For as far as EKGs and other cardiac testing like echoes, stress tests, et cetera, and chest x-rays like you asked about, routine indications apply. So if your patient's having chest pain or shortness of breath when they come into the office for their pre-op exam, then you should get them an EKG or a chest x-ray, just like you would for any other patient. But the fact that they're having surgery shouldn't change your indication for getting any of those tests. If they have a history of an MI, then they probably already have a baseline EKG in their chart. So you don't need to get another one. But if you can't find a baseline EKG, it's probably a good idea to get one. One important point is that the American Car College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association say that if you have an asymptomatic patient, meaning they can climb one flight of stairs without chest pain, who's undergoing a minor surgery, you don't need to get any pre-op cardiac testing regardless of how bad their cardiac history is. That's actually great to know because I feel like I am always scared of those patients that have a cardiac history. But, you know, most of the time we're taking these patients back to do like a hysteroscopy DNC or something like that. Exactly. So if that patient's asymptomatic, they can just proceed to surgery. They don't need anything, even a baseline EKG. I think my other question too is like these patients who clearly have a medical history, a lot of times they take a bunch of medications. They're taking like sometimes six, seven, eight medications. And I'm always confused as to, t as to what medicines they should be taking the day of their surgery. So should I tell them to like stop all their medications? Are there certain ones that they really should be taking the day of their surgery? And if they don't, will like anesthesia cancel my case? <laughs> so that's a really important point. Especially older patients have a lot of um, medical comorbidities. 
the two most common I think that I encounter as a urogyne fellow are hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Um, and there are large, prospective, really well-designed trials that have shown that abrupt discontinuation of beta blockers before surgery results in actually increased cardiac morbidity and mortality. So anybody taking beta blockers chronically preoperatively should continue them perioperatively. That means take it the morning of surgery too, unless they have a serious contraindication uh, like post-op hypotension, then you would want to stop their beta blocker. But it really, they really need to give you a good reason to stop it. Similarly, there's increasing evidence that discontinuing statins abruptly before surgery also increases cardiac complications. So same thing, patients on statins chronically pre-op should continue them perioperatively. Take it the morning of surgery, and it should be ordered for them to take it in the hospital after surgery. Uh, antihypertensives and diuretics are a little bit more complicated, but in general, you should keep in mind that anesthesia tends to lower your blood pressure, so any antihypertensive can exacerbate this effect, leading to more clinically significant perioperative hypotension. When we've done studies, continuing antihypertensives perioperatively hasn't led to an increase in any adverse events, but more patients had transient post-op hypotension in the groups that continued their blood pressure meds, so in general, we should stop most antihypertensives the morning of surgery and then restart the day after. That being said, patients with poorly controlled hypertension and those on clonidine are at risk for exacerbation of their hypertension or rebound hypertension if you stop their meds abruptly. So this rule is kind of soft and can be individualized based on the situation. <clears throat> what about meds that are more specific in like our population or like in OBGYN patients, things that are like uh, HRT or um, oral contraceptives? Yeah, so ACOG actually has specific recommendations about this, so I think this could potentially be high yield for CREOGs. We've known for a long time that estrogen increases your risk of venous thromboembolism, and so we used to recommend that anybody on exogenous estrogen, whether it's oral contraceptive pills or hormone replacement therapy, stop taking those meds one to two weeks before surgery, and we thought that that would be enough to mitigate their risk of VTE. We know now, actually, that normalization of clotting factors after stopping your es exogenous estrogen takes four to six weeks at a minimum. So, wow. So probably stopping one to two weeks wasn't really modifying anybody's risk. Huh. Additionally, the absolute risk increase for VTE that's attributable to exogenous estrogen is probably really, really small relative to the increase in risk that you get just from undergoing a surgery. This means that the risk of unintended pregnancy in a premenopausal woman who's on OCPs, if you stop them four to six weeks before surgery, is much, much higher than, the risk, than her risk of VTE. So you should probably keep her OCPs on board and protect her from unintended pregnancy, which is a higher risk situation than, than her risk of periop uh, VTE. Got it. For postmenopausal women who are on really low-dose hormone replacement therapy, which all hormone replacement therapy is very low-dose low dose now, um, the absolute increase in risk of VTE is really negligible when compared with the risk increase of undergoing surgery. It's also important to note that we have no data suggesting that stopping these medications, no matter what the time frame before surgery, actually mitigates your risk of VTE. So there's no data to suggest that it helps. It may actually be harmful. So um, in general, you don't need to stop OCPs or hormone, hormone replacement therapy preoperatively, but you should consider any exogenous estrogen a risk for VTE when you're considering prophylaxis for your patient. So while we're on the topic of VTEs, obviously it's a thing that we need to consider when we're having patients that undergo surgery. So what should we be doing to prevent VTEs in the OR? Um, it seems like in ROR, for example, everybody gets, um, gets, those, gets the boots, and sometimes they also get pharmacologic prophylaxis. But who really should be getting pharmacologic prophylaxis versus just getting their SCVs? Yeah. So ACOG also has a practice bull in addressing the many complexities of this, this issue. Uh, you're not wrong that everybody seems to get SCVs since a lot of hospitals use them routinely, whether they're indicated or not. Mm. Um, for the purpose of CREOGS, you should know that low-risk patients who are having short surgical procedures, things like a DNC or a hysteroscopy, et cetera, don't even need SCDs. They can just have, quote, aggressive mobilization post-op. When we think about risk factors for VTE, they're all pretty obvious. They're things like older age, uh, cancer, known clotting disorders, of course, like factor V Leiden, a history of a prior DVT or PE, estrogen use, like I mentioned before, smoking, obesity, et cetera. 
And ACOG lists all of these risk factors in their practice bulletin and really tries to simplify risk stratification. Um, but you should know that the actual source of these guidelines is the American College of Chest Physicians recommendations. And uh, they recommend pretty clearly using the Caprini scoring system, which has been extensively studied, including in gynecologic and gyne-onc patients. Uh, and the Caprini score takes into account all of the risk factors that ACOG lists in the practice bulletin, but takes it a step further and assigns them a specific score based on the severity of the risk. The additive score, when you add everything up in the Caprini score, results in a recommendation about how you should prophylax your patient. Uh, another important point is that cancer patients who have major surgery should be getting extended prophylaxis, which means four to six weeks of heparin or Lovenox uh, after surgery. What about antibiotics? Now, that's another thing that I guess there are some surgeries, especially in GYN, that get it, some surgeries in GYN that don't. Sometimes I feel like it just depends on the situation. What What's kind of the general rules with antibiotics? Yeah. So ACOG also has a practice bulletin about this, and it was just recently updated. Um, antibiotic prophylaxis, like you said, totally depends on the surgical procedure and on the patient's allergies. I think the most testable points on this topic are um, that any clean procedure, things like diagnostic or operative laparoscopy where you're not opening the vag vagina or bowel, those procedures don't need any antibiotic prophylaxis, none. So things like tubal ligation, ovarian cystectomy, surgeries for endometriosis, et cetera, no antibiotics. Even laparotomy, where you aren't opening the vagina or bowel, which I know is super rare, but possible, technically doesn't need any antibiotics either, though ACOG now concedes that you could consider using a first-generation cephalosporin, something like cefazolin. Clean contaminated procedures, which are most gyne surgeries, including any route of hysterectomy, whether vaginal, abdominal, laparoscopic, anytime you're making an incision in the vagina, those patients should get a first-generation cephalosporin, something like cefazolin, 2 grams IV. And I think one testable point is that that should be adjusted to 3 grams IV for patients who weigh more than 120 kilos. Any urogyne procedure or a procedure where there's going to be a lot of vaginal dissection, um, and that is to say any procedure where you have greater exposure to the anaerobic flora that lives in the vagina, those patients need a regimen that has better anaerobic coverage than a first-generation cephalosporin. So ACOG recommends Clinda or Flagyl plus Gent or Astrianam, but another reasonable choice that's a lot simpler is a second-generation cephalosporin, something like Cefoxetin. One change that happened with the newest update of this antibiotic practice bulletin is that ACOG used to recommend antibiotics for chromoperturbation or hysterosalpingogram, uh, but now says that instead of giving antibiotics for all patients, they recommend doxycycline, 100 milligrams BID for five days after the procedure, only if the patient has a known history of PID or if, they, if you see abnormal tubes on the study. Otherwise, no antibiotics needed. ACOG also clarified their recommendations about penicillin allergic patients, and the one thing to know is that you only need to adjust your antibiotics if patients have a true immediate hypersensitivity reaction to penicillin. So anaphylaxis, bronchospasm, or urticaria, or also obviously Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Don't give a, a cephalosporin to those patients. Um, but anyone else can get a cephalosporin if their history is just a rash or nausea or diarrhea, whatever, you, they can get a cephalosporin. The cross-reactivity level is actually quite low. And lastly, although it's not technically perioperative care, as a urogyne fellow, I'd be remiss if I talked about antibiotics and didn't remind you that when repairing obstetric anal sphincter injuries, a single dose of a second-generation cephalosporin decreases wound breakdown by two-thirds. So that was a lot of good information, and I know this podcast might be a little bit longer than usual, but not to fret everybody, Faye and I are going to make sure that on the website we've got links to a lot of the resources that we mentioned throughout the podcast today. Right now, I think we're going to try and do a quick summary of everything that we've covered today. So we started out talking about estimating perioperative risk, and we talked about three particular calculators that you may encounter, the ASA score the Revised Cardiac Risk Index, and the NSQIP score. We also talked about pre-op testing, and we said that ACOG doesn't really make any formal recommendations about pre-op lab and cardiopulmonary testing, and really, you know, you should be getting a lot of what you think you should be getting via testing through the history and physical. Um, 
So not everybody is going to need an EKG or a chest X-ray. Um, and really, people who are getting minor procedures don't necessarily need um, a lot of the workup that we used to do. However, the one thing that we do want to highlight is getting a pre-op glucose for diabetics because the American Diabetic Association has said that a high glucose has been associated with increase in post-op infection. In terms of medication management, we talked a lot about different meds, but again, the general rule is that the meds you don't discontinue prior to surgery are beta blockers and statins. You should also continue OCPs or other forms of contraception, and HRT is okay to continue as well. Things that you can discontinue or may want to discontinue on a case-by-case -case basis would be other antihypertensives, diuretics, and other home medication. We also talked a lot about VT prophylaxis, and it does seem like everybody gets SCDs, but really people who are coming in who are young, healthy, don't have any risk factors, or are getting a short surgical procedure don't even need the SCDs. However, to really risk stratify your patients, you should be using the Caprini scoring system. And patients who are at high risk of getting a DVT, people who have active cancer or who have history of DVT or PE, really should be getting pharmacologic prophylaxis. And finally, we touched on the newly updated practice bulletin regarding antibiotics and gynecologic surgery in general. Gynecologic surgery falls into clean contaminated procedures where the general antibiotic of choice would be cefazolam, or two grams IV. If you're going to do a lot of vaginal dissection, you may need something that gives you better anaerobic coverage, typically clindoflagyl, gent as trianam, or you could use a second generation cephalosporin. As Lauren said, be sure you remember on your OB things that if you have an obstetric anal sphincter injury, give a single dose of a second generation cephalosporin. One thing that we didn't cover in this podcast, but we will in future podcasts, and we will include this resource because it does um, have to do with what we're talking about today, uh, is the committee opinion number 750, which talks about the enhanced recovery after surgery or ERAS protocol, which is something that you should also be reviewing when you're talking about perioperative care with your patients. All right, Lauren, thank you very much for being here on our podcast with us to teach us about perioperative care. Anything you want to leave us with? Uh, just remember, Eurogyne is the best. Thank you, everyone. Once again, I'm Faye. I'm Nick. And this has been Kriogs Over Coffee. Guys, if you like the podcast today, or if you want to give Lauren some love, be sure to rate us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on Twitter at Kriogs Over Coff, C-O-F-F -F number one. You can also find us on Facebook at Kriogs Over Coffee and visit our website where we'll have a lot of good information with our posted episodes at www.kriogsovercoffee.com. And if you have any questions or concerns or any topics that you'd like for us to cover, you can email us at kriogsovercoffee at gmail.com.